Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Coffee and Tea with AARP, our bi-weekly conversation with which AARP staff and volunteers talk to Connecticut decision makers about policies and programs that are of interest to older residents. My name is John Erlinghauser. I'm the Senior Advocacy Director for AARP in Connecticut, and today we're very, very pleased and lucky to have with us a very special guest, State Representative Mitch Belinsky of the 106th District. He's the ranking member of the legislature's aging committee, and he also serves on the important appropriation and education committees. Representative Blinsky, can you tell us a little bit about your background, maybe outside of the legislature, what towns are in the 106th district, and anything that you'd like people to know about yourself before we kind of get into the meat of what you're working on? That's great. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and you did a very, very nice job of, of doing about half of my introduction anyway. So thank you. Um, you know, uh, this is, uh, it, it's an honor to, to speak with, with you at, uh, at AARP. And I also want to just express before I get going on this thing, my gratitude for, you know, the support from a policy perspective that we get from AARP and its volunteers, um, all the time. You guys are really, really a a, a terrific, maybe, well, the uh, definitive voice for, um, you know, for seniors, I uh, like to use the word golden residents uh, instead, but you, you guys are it, and what the, what you and the volunteers say usually goes to the top of the list as far as how we consider the perspectives of what we legislate. So, but just a tiny little bit about me, I'm uh, uh, in my Sixth term right now. I've served 12 years in the General Assembly, uh, and uh, I am very, very proud to represent the place that my family um, calls home uh, that we love, which is Newtown, Connecticut. And um, so I represent, uh, I'm a single town district, quote unquote, which means I represent only people in Newtown, Sandy Hook, Hollyville, Botsford, you know, our little sub towns and things like that. And I've done that since 2013, and it's uh, it's been quite a ride. But uh, uh, probably the honor of uh, of my life, because uh, you know, professionally, I sort of started out. Well, I didn't sort of start out. Uh, I'm a marketing professional at heart, and uh, by education. So I, you know, I spent the first 30 years of my um, phase one life being a, a marketing professional. And working through new product development, regulatory affairs, a uh, little bit of legislative liaison type work. So, you know, a little bit connected to where I ended up, but uh, never really thought that I would be representing um, the town that I, that, you know, that, that we love and, and live in. Nor did I think that uh, we'd be uh, delving into areas of, of policy when it comes to the lives of, of the people that we love. Um, and my connection to that really is through my parents my and my in-laws. Um, we, uh, in, in, in our home and in, you know, assisted living type facilities, my wife and I uh, really spent 10 years of our lives running the affairs and caring for uh, our loved one. First, my father-in-law, then my father, uh, who had Alzheimer's. So, um, and that was a long, long, difficult journey. And then my mom, who who actually passed at the very, very beginning of the pandemic, but not not from um, not not from COVID nineteen. She actually passed in a in a uh, um, in an assisted living facility um, in what I like to tell people was a case of um, uh, neglect. That was brought on by that pandemic and the isolation. So it was, uh, I mean, it was a really uh, difficult time in our lives and here in this family. Um, and it cemented what I was already working on with the aging committee um, and just sort of kicked everything into really high gear. And we've been working off of that platform for um well, I mean, for over 10 years in the aging yeah. world, but over the past four or five years, um, we've become a 
big, big, big committee of focus because the issues that have to do with aging in place um, and the aging that happens in, in uh, assisted living and uh, you know, skilled nursing type facilities um, have always been something of a concern to most of us that have elderly relatives because we believe that there are better ways to care for the folks that we love. Right. So it's, you know, to, to some degree, I use my marketing background um, and my inclination towards um, fulfilling needs and wants okay. with research to try to understand um, holistically what's going on in the real world and what we can do to improve um, conditions and just make it better. And one of the most significant things that research tells us right now is that 75 or 80 percent of the folks that we see in, in the golden community, um, they don't want to age in a nursing home. Right. They are really, really, really focused on being able to age in place. We call it age in place, but um, I mean, the, the, the definition of it is people get to stay in their homes or, or they, uh, you know, live in the homes of, uh, of their loved ones. Usually right, that home and community-based care. The community that, that's, that's so important. So let me ask you this, Representative. Well, first of all, I, I got to tell you, um, I live a little bit south, uh, excuse me, west, uh, east of you down in Derby. So you're not too far away from me in Newtown. And uh, so I, I, I'm aware of the great work you do for the folks in Newtown. And uh, I'm very, very pleased with that. And uh, I can also relate to you as well. I was the primary living caregiver for my mother who had Alzheimer's. And so I, I know what that's like and, and can relate to that. But now you've mentioned the aging committee. Yeah. And um, I mentioned in your introduction that you're the ranking member of the aging committee. So before we get into some of the issues that you've worked on and are working on through the aging committee, what is your what does it mean to be the ranking member? What does that role entail? And and why is it such a critical role for uh, for us to be concerned about? Well, it, it, that's a great question, because very, very few people out in the real world know what uh, what goes on in the halls of government. So the. The quick answer to it is that, you know, everything we do in government uh, has sort of a, 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 you know, a political slant to it. Um, there are two types of leadership in every committee. Okay, the first uh, set of leaders belong to the majority party. In this case, in Connecticut, um, you know, the Democrats uh, are. So our committee is led by um, by one. House chair and one Senate chair, uh, namely Jane Garibay, who's my house partner, and um, Jan Hockadell, who is partnered with um, my co-ranking member, Lisa Seminero, in the Senate. So what we have is a leadership team of basically four people. Um, we're titled differently, but the only way to work effectively as a committee is for all of us to share a lot of common vision. And I got to tell you that uh, from, from my perspective in the House of Representatives, um, Jane Garibay and I, she, she refers to us as the dream team, which sort of makes me blush. Um, but, but it really is true because we, we speak practically every day about issues that that matter and we um, are very 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 deliberate in understanding that those issues are far bigger than political garbage um, so we don't let the politics get in the way of what we know and find and can define by research um, is the right thing to do for, for people um, and Jane has a heart that's about as big as the entire state of well, Connecticut's a small state, so her, her heart's probably about the size of the state of Alaska. She lives this thing every day. She recently lost a, a loved one um, in a nursing facility, and um, and she is a caregiver for uh, for another loved one. So she she understands this, and she spends an awful lot of time in the field visiting 
you know, folks in facilities and people that are aging in place. So um, I couldn't ask for a, 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 a more caring partner who really, really gets it. So um, we use our strengths together. And the funny, not the funny thing, but the significant thing about this committee is that, you know, since Jane and I took this co um, leadership role in the House side of it um, with our partners in the Senate, of course, we have been remarkably what, what they call in the halls of uh, Hartford government bipartisan. I like to call it um, nonpartisan. Right. Because um, the issues are the issues. How we deal with them is where political differences occur. But the fact is, if if we're nonpartisan, we can work together and we can we can do remarkable things with policy. And then do it with the kind of conviction that makes what we're doing um, pass with unanimous support in the House and the Senate, which is something that we, we kicked off last year. Um, in 2023, we had a, a a bill that started as four different bills. It was House Bill 5781, and um, it was it was a huge policy bill that that sort of, you know put a a stake in the ground about you know what's important to us in Connecticut as far as the aging in place initiatives, accountability on the part of uh, of nursing homes supports for aging in place and, and and some significant pieces of policy that that basically said to the whole wide world that you know this is how Kevin Dickett feels um you know is the, the best direction to just sort of encapsulate the whole effort. And you know not everything that was in that bill happened immediately, but the, the fact that we 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 put that stake in the ground for policy areas, um, gave us the platform to continue working on. And we did such a job last year passing, um, you know, 5781 unanimously in the House and the Senate. And then the governor held, you know, basically hosted a party in Windsor where where he signed this bill and, um, you know, and we all took this giant group hug, which is not something that you see in government right. very often. Um, well, I have but, to say, Representative, you know, we, we at ARP, we look because we're a nonpartisan organization. You know, we don't endorse candidates. We don't make contributions. So we love it when. And, and so that's why we're so pleased on the aging committee when, you know, we have people like Representative Garibay and yourself who come together and and, and try to and, and bring you know, sometimes from different perspectives, but bring those perspectives together in a nonpartisan way to come up with the best product. And, uh, you know, we were very proud, frankly, to be able to honor you as one of our uh, 2023 caregiving champions for all of the work that you did on getting that piece of legislation passed and bringing it forward, because it is, you know, it is kind of uh, setting the direction that, you know, the state needs to go on uh, when, when it comes to kind of hum, uh, home and community-based care and support for a family and relative caregivers. So that that's really critical to us. And we do, we do appreciate that. So, you know, that was great work that you guys did. Um, and we really appreciate what you bring from the minority party's perspective on that aging committee and, and the fact that you bring it back to your caucus and help us get them on board with it, as well as Representative Garibay does with her caucus. So now here we are in 2024, you've got the aging committee. I know we, ARP and ARP, uh, staff and volunteers were able to stand with you and Representative Garibay again not too long ago. Um, um, but what are some of the priorities? What, what is it the aging committee wants to do, you know, in 2024? Because again, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. So what are you looking at to help uh, move the ball forward again this year? Uh, that's that's a wonderful question. Thank you. I love talking about this. Um, we opened the door so wide last year and got so many people believing in the fact that doing the nonpartisan thing was really, really, really huge. That you know, the same same guy who basically threw us a party in Windsor to celebrate five seven eight one 
Governor Lamont, um, he did something this year where he put his stake in the ground on aging policy with House Bill 5046. We call it the governor's bill, and it's a pretty wide-ranging omnibus bill with a bunch of different elements to it. I'll cover those in a moment, but the fact that we got a governor's bill um, comes with a certain amount of um, the governor's clout. And it, it pretty much assures that we're going to pass significant policies this year with his support. So, uh, you know, Jane and I, uh, Jan and, and, and Lisa are working directly with governor staff on details of the policy that's in 5046 so that we can continue to have it move forward and have the bipartisan agreement that, uh, that goes forward. And everybody's been wonderful to work with on that. But that's not enough. It didn't actually stop there. Speaker of the House, Matt Ritter, also decided to have a speaker's bill dedicated to the aging committee this year. And that's a House Bill 5001. So we have literally two historic policy documents running through the Connecticut General Assembly. Um, and we're the ones that are setting that direction with the support of um, of people that are, you know, closer to the top of the food chain than we are. So that's really flattering, and it's an incredible honor. And, you know, I try not to throw the word bipartisan or nonpartisan around too much because it, it it's political in and of itself when you start talking that way. Um, but when we define what that's supposed to mean, you're watching that happen right now in the aging committee. Um, and I, you know, I, I'll go out on a limb and say that, you know, there is no other committee that's in this, um, in the, in the 2024 Connecticut General Assembly that's working this way with this much fluidity and this much unity of purpose. And, and, you know, that, um, that chokes me up. It, 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 it it's absolutely mind boggling that we have this kind of support. So we're trying very, very, very hard um, to, you know, sort of stay within our lane um, and respect the the, the, the um, opportunity to do this work because we know that it's going to last for a long, long time and, and make it better for the lives of folks that we on the aging community are focused on. Well, and, you know, AARP is strongly in support of those two pieces of legislation, Represent Blensky, and we really appreciate the work that you're doing on them. And, I, you know, I will just say, you know, I know you've been around 12 years in the legislature, and I've been with AARP. Uh, this is my 21st session. I was a staffer in the building for four years, and in all my years, I've never seen such significant legislation come together like it has out of the aging committee. You know, it used to be like, you know, aging committee was a kind of secondary committee and nobody really, you know, paid a lot of attention to it. But I will just say, you know, you uh, yourself and Representative Garibay and certainly your center, Senate counterparts have really done an amazing job in bringing focus to the work of your committee and then getting buy in from, you know, your leadership and and House uh, Democrat leadership and the governor that we really are going to get some amazing changes moving forward when it comes to nursing homes and, and, and community based care. So um, we, we commend you for that that work, and, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on that. So we talked about aging committee, but you're also on some other committees. You're on the very powerful appropriations committee. Um, that means an awful lot. I know they concluded a, a few weeks ago the work on the uh, appropriations committee. So why don't you talk a little bit about you know the appropriations committee and what your priorities are for for the state of Connecticut when it comes to how we spend our money. Thank you very much, John. You know, it's interesting. We had a very, very long, like a six and a half hour long committee meeting. And we considered, I think, 22, maybe 23 pieces of go forward legislation. And let's just say that uh, the agreement <laughs> and the, you know, the, the, you know, sort of like the group hug and kumbaya parts of it, were not as strong as they are in aging. But, uh, but we always seem to be able to find, you know, some common ground there, uh, around issues of significance. And um, the vote's a little bit more split there, but uh, it's important from, from an appropriations perspective. 
you know, I've been on that committee for about uh, oh, for 12 years. And, um, you know, in that time, I can remember as a, you know, as a freshman, you know, I used to look at this budget and I had no earthly idea what the heck all that stuff was because it was, you know, hundreds of pages of, uh, of, of things. And, um, you know, until you clue yourself into every single line of it, um, you don't truly see the picture. After 12 years, uh, I know exactly what pieces of it are important to me and where to, you know, how to go to them first. Um, and I'm all about this. Uh, I'm, I'm all about the aging in place thing on aging and and the way it fits in the way we conduct all of our other state services is important to me. So I'm not a believer in institutional type care, you know, just like I'm not a, a fan of traditional nursing homes as opposed to aging in place. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, things like mental health and um, medical care and, and, and just regulations about housing and things like that, I, I believe that the control should be in the hands of the people that are that we're representing. So I like local control um, and I like uh, community nonprofits versus institutional type care because that happens in the community. It's close to home. And, and here's the commonality of the theme. It, 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 it's very much like the aging in place initiative because people don't have to leave the community to get cared for. So the continuum of care is always, is always moving in the direction of being focused on the individual. Um, and, um, you know, right now, one of the biggest uh, bugaboos that I have in the budget is that we've really done, we, we could have done a much better job at addressing the needs of our community nonprofits because, you know, for, for more than a decade, um, their funding has been relatively flat, but, you know, cost of living is, you know, 10 years is probably up uh, 35 or 40 percent. So our community nonprofits are struggling. And, you know, we continue to pump additional money into the agency care model. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's not as close to my community as, um, as the nonprofit. So I'm a big fan of the nonprofits and I'm, and I think that we need to pay better attention to them in the future. This budget that's coming through right now um, is really interesting because it, it's it's establishing some it's establishing a precedent that I I have not seen in my 12 years. Um, because the governor's budget, you know, fits within what the state calls its fiscal guardrails. It's you know it's a balanced budget, but it. Um, in, in many ways, there are folks that are, you know, dissatisfied with how it deals with little individual pieces and parts. Um, but it's a pretty responsible budget, and, and it's one that I respect a lot. We always, as a committee in appropriations, we always have our own budget. So we counter the governor's budget every year with a budget of our own. But the leadership of appropriations this year deferred to the governor's budget. And we did our subcommittee process. We were working on the budget literally for months. And there was a formal announcement by our chairs on the appropriations committee that we were not going to publish a competing budget. We were going to go with the foundation of the governor's budget and then, you know, do a little bit of redistribution within it. So that's still a work in process. That's interesting. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating, and it's like I said, it's never happened in my twelve years. So it's that's that I'm looking forward to it now. From a you know, from a perspective of other priorities, I do know that you know the Republican caucus, my folks are working on the budget document um, because there are things that we you know that we care pretty deeply right. about, including the nonprofits, including um, you know the um, health and safety issues that, uh, you know, we see concerns within our communities. 
uh, and you know, matters like that. And, and we're all we're always focused on local control. We don't want we don't want government telling our towns what to do. So, Representative, we're 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 coming up close to our time here. So let me just ask you a couple of quick other things. Any other priorities you want to quickly mention um, that you, that are for, that you have this year? Um, you know what, my priorities are the priorities of my constituents. So, um, you know, very 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 laser focused on you know on public safety. Um, uh, I re I'm always reluctant to say what I'm about to say because it because it's not something um, that I take lightly, but I represent a town that um, that has a different perspective on, on on our public safety than most towns because of you know the events of 2012. Yes, um, yes. So um, I'm very focused on that. You know, in the education committee, which is another committee of mine, you know, we saw we saw some activity that looks like it came from a third party. Uh, to try to uh, diminish the effectiveness of what you know are the preparedness drills for crises, um, and, and um, you know the officials of Newtown and I testified with all of our uh, heart and all of our feeling and all of our knowledge um, that um, you know not to involve us, Connecticut State Police. Department of Homeland Security, the people that have worked with us for 12 years or 11 years on these drills, to not have us as a stakeholder at the table was uh, what was just simply not right. Um, and we uh, we had them remove their proposal from the 2024 bill that was considering that with the right. promise that we were going to come to the table. So, you know, for me, uh, I'm a marketing guy, not a politician. You know, I'm all about, you know, the people that drive me. Um, right. You know, and that's at the very most basic level. I'm not interested in the interests of special interests. Um, right. The interests of human beings um, that I call my neighbors and my friends. It's very clear you are very passionate about helping those in the aging community, and we appreciate that. And it's also very clear that you care very deeply and work very hard for the people in Newtown. Having said that, my final question, I guess, is how would you suggest, you know, our members, your constituents get more involved in the process? How can they stay informed about the work you're doing? You know, how can they participate in the workings of government? What are your suggestions and recommendations? Well, first of all, um, anybody on the in the senior community that wants to get involved in, in, in senior affairs needs to be a member of AARP um, because because there's nobody in the legislature uh, or at the Capitol for that matter that's more visible than all of those people in red shirts that come and visit us on just about every issue. Um, you guys, you guys are. Are, are like the living and breathing conscience of, of, of the entire process. So the advocacy that you do, you know, for if I were talking to a stranger that wasn't familiar with AARP, I'd say, you need to get involved with these guys because they understand, you know, how to get things done the right way and, and be, be heard as a bigger voice. Um, and then I would also encourage every human being that, doesn't know exactly what's going on in government, which is easy to not know because it's confusing as heck. Um, get to know the person that represents you at the very lowest level of state government, which is your state representative. So I, I represent 25,000 people here in Newtown and St. Louis. And my ears are always open. People know how to reach me. Some of them call me at home. I'm still in a phone book, believe it or not. There used to be phone books. But I get phone calls on my cell phone. I get them on my office phone. I get on Facebook and Messenger and all kinds of stuff like that. And it gets overwhelming because, I mean, there are days when I'll talk about 350 or 400 messages. I don't get back to everybody all at once, but anybody who takes the time to write to me, personal message or a question, it, it gets it gets taken care of. So, um, you should never be afraid to make your opinion known to the people that represent you. And the person that's most likely to pay the closest attention is the one who has 
the 25,000 people versus a state senator who's, you know, got 75 or 80,000 people that they represent or, or, you know, like a congressional person who's representing uh, a half a million people or a, a, a federal senator that's representing three and a half million people. So, um, and, and people like people like me, I have relationships with the folks that are, you know, in those bigger positions. When when a federal when a federal issue comes before me, you know, I typically find that my go-to person is is, is Senator Blumenthal. Um, you know, he's terribly terribly concerned and and all over senior issues, veterans issues and things like that and he's completely responsive to me when I turn them on when I turn him on to the needs of, of, of my constituents. Um you know and politically we're you know we don't see eye to eye on much of anything, but when it comes to constituent service, he and I are completely and totally on the same channel. Well that's important, Representative Blinsky. So we certainly do. Uh, I, I want to just on behalf of our members, you know, once again, thank you for all the work that you do with uh, uh, not only ARP, but, but all of your constituents and the people that you care about in Connecticut. And we're, again, very pleased and proud to, to honor you as a 2023 caregiving champion for your work in the legislature, specifically on the aging committee. And appreciate you joining our um, viewers today. And uh, we know that uh, we'll be working very closely with you throughout the rest of the legislative session. So thank you so much, Representative Belinsky, for your time. And uh, I'm just going to wrap up here. So we'd like to thank all of you for joining us for another episode of Coffee and Tea with AARP Connecticut. Join us again in two weeks for another episode and catch back episodes on demand right here on our Facebook page or on our YouTube page. You can also scan the QR code to become an e-advocate and help us advance policies important to the 50 plus here in Connecticut, just like Representative Walensky suggested. So thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again.